It's not just about the manger where the baby lay. It's not all about the angels who sang for him that day. It's not all about the shepherds or the bright and shining star. It's not all about the wise men who traveled from afar. It's about the cross. It's about my sin. It's about how Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again. It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. It's about the cross. about the good things in this life I've done. It's not all about the treasures or the trophies that I've won. It's not about the righteousness that I find within. It's all about His precious blood that saved me from my sin. It's about the cross, it's about my sin, it's about how Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again. It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. It's about the cross. The beginning of the story is wonderful and great, but it's the ending that can save you, and that's why we celebrate. It's about the cross. It's about my sin. Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again. It's about the soul to a tree. It's about how every drop of blood that flowed from him when it should have been me. It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I could have real someday so that you and I could have real life someday it's about the cross it's about the cross it's about the cross it's about the cross it's about the
so thankful to be back in your house today to worship you. We're thankful for the many blessings that you've given us this week. We come to you now as we're about to receive your word. Would you open our hearts, let us learn, and apply it to our lives. We pray for Brother Milan as he's about to give your word. Lord, we ask that you bless him and bless this church. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to join me in God's word in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. The Gospel of John, chapter 8. I entitled this this morning to uh, the lonely and hopeless, or helpless. I changed my mind. I put hopeless on mine, but helpless up there, so I, that's fine. Got two different things. In the very beginning, God saw Adam, and he said it wasn't good for man to live alone. Unfortunately, there's people all around us that are alone. They may be living with someone, but they still feel 
alone. You can be in a, a room full of people and still feel alone. There's going to be many people in hell with many other people around them, but they'll be alone. Being alone is very, very troubling. God knew it from the very beginning. In fact, uh, it tells us the story of Saul. You remember Saul when he was converted? Saul had uh, uh, persecuted the church, and Saul was going about doing what he thought he was supposed to be doing, and, and, and God met him on the road to Damascus, and he uh, struck him with blindness. He had to be led by the hand into the town and found himself there, I think he said, about three days in the town with no sight, not eating, really not talking to anyone. He was all by himself. All alone. But God provides. God provided. He sent Ananias. He said, I need you to go down uh, and talk to this man called Saul. And he said, now, I don't know if I want to go talk to him. I mean, that guy's a bad dude. I mean, he's, he's done a lot of things. But the Lord said he doesn't need to be alone. You need to go put your hand on him. Sometimes that's what people need is somebody. Somebody. There's people all around us that needs somebody. In fact, you look in God's word. He said, rich man in hell, he lifted up his eyes. He said he was in torment. In torment, there's many different ways of tormenting a person, but I really believe he talked about his, the flames and his tongues. He doesn't mention it, but I can imagine he's lonely because no one could help him because he was helpless. He couldn't do anything for himself. He was relying on someone else to come and do something for him. He was lonely. He was helpless. And what could he see from afar off? He could see Lazarus. And when he saw Lazarus, he didn't see Lazarus by himself. He saw Lazarus with someone, didn't he? He saw him with someone. Abraham. Oh, isn't it amazing? One thing, great thing about heaven is we'll not be lonely we will be with people we love and people that love us and we'll be with our Heavenly Father that loves us and we do love Him. We will not be alone. But now that's looking ahead, but we need to look in the presence. Here in verse 1 of chapter 8, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning He came again into the temple and all the people came unto Him and He sat down and He taught them. Jesus was teaching the people. When he came to this earth, he spent time teaching people. He wanted them to have an understanding of the truth. They said unto him, Master, this woman... Well, uh, 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 let me back up. I jumped too far. Verse 3. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what say thou? Jesus is trying to teach these people the ways of God. And here comes these Pharisees and Sadducees and all these that think that they have all the answers. And they bring this woman that's been caught in the very act of adultery. Now when they brought this woman, you need to understand something. She was by herself. Even though she had a mob around her, she stood by herself. No one was there to defend her. She didn't have a, a appointed a lawyer. She was by herself. By herself. She knew her sins. She knew her conviction. She knew what the sentence was for what she had done. She was alone and she was helpless. There was really no hope for her. She knew what the outcome was going to be. I mean, wasn't she sitting there hoping that things would go her way? She knew exactly what the penalty for her sin was, and she had no one else, no one else. Isn't it amazing? You remember uh, Adam and Eve in the very beginning and uh, when they uh, took of the fruit um, they weren't supposed to partake of? What did they do? They wanted to do the blame game. Adam says that woman. Woman says that serpent. You know, we want to blame other people. But look, folks, we need to understand when we stand before God, when we stand in our conditions, there's no escape. We answer for ourselves. Here's where she found herself, all alone, helpless, and hopeless. 
The Pharisees, they were looking at this woman. They were condemning this woman. But you know what they weren't doing? They weren't looking at themselves. It's easy for us to condemn people around us. It's easy for me to look at your, uh, your, your flaws and your faults. You know, and you got ugly hair. You got an ugly nose. I mean, I can stand and judge all day long. But we don't like to look at ourselves. I will say real quick, oh, I know I have my flaws. But we don't want to stand and be honest with ourselves. You know, when we look at our flaws and we want to compare ourselves, I can say I'm taller than uh, somebody. I can say I'm, I had to look hard. I can say I'm thinner than some people. Not a lot, but some. You know, you can just keep going on and on. But the standard isn't Jim. It, 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 it isn't Greg over here. You know what the standard is? God. His son, Jesus Christ. That's the standard. Can anyone say that I've been a better person than Jesus Christ? There's not a one of us. Can anyone say that I love people more than Jesus loved people? None of us. We all know that we are guilty. But we want to compare it to other folks. This woman stood by herself. Jesus teaching. And they said, what do you say? What do you say, Jesus? This they said, doing this to tempt him, that he might have uh, uh, accused, that, that they may accuse him. But Jesus sto uh, stooped down, and with his finger he wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. And when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Now, we find Jesus at two different occasions writing on the ground. As he's writing on the ground, he's paying really no attention to those people around him because that really is just a racket. That's just a racket. The only truth and only real facts is what Jesus is doing. And Jesus is writing on the, on, on the ground. And I got to believe that people weren't paying attention to what Jesus was writing. They saw him writing, but I don't believe anybody was paying attention to what he was writing. Because it didn't affect them until the second time that he stooped down to begin to write. People then began to notice that he was writing something that had meaning, something that directed at them. That's kind of like the preacher when he preaches on Sunday morning. Man, boy, I don't know what Brother Jim's been doing, but the preacher sure was preaching at him today. I'll, and I don't mean this to be disrespectful to my, my wife's or grandmother, but I, I'll never forget us going to Tennessee I, was several years ago. We'd gone to see her grandmother and went to church with her, and I, I'll never forget. We went to their church, and on our way home, was going back from preaching, and this is what her, her grandmother said. says, I don't know who that preacher was preaching to today, but he was letting them have it, wasn't he? <laughs> he was letting them have it. Isn't that amazing? We think that all the, the scriptures and all the, the things are, are to somebody else. Let me tell you something. If God didn't have this message for you today, he would have you somewhere else to hear the message he'd had for you. Because this message is for you today. So when Jesus was writing on the sand for people to see, it was for them to see for them. For them. God put this in, in the Word here today for me. For me. And it said, he began to write, said, who here today is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. I mean, they found fault in this woman. They knew what the law said. They knew that she should be convicted of sin. What would stop someone from picking up a stone and to begin to cast? I imagine first uh, they, from people thought in mind, okay, he told us to do it, let's, let's do it. And, and I can imagine some of them probably thought, reach down to maybe grab a stone. And all of a sudden as they was reaching down, they noticed what he was writing and, and Buddy hit him right between the eyes. Uh... I've done some things wrong too. I mean, in fact, God's word tells us about adultery. They caught this woman in adultery, the very act. But Jesus said that uh, for a man to look upon a woman and lust after her is the same thing as committing adultery. 
Jesus is writing in the sand and he's hitting them right between the eyes. That, hey, I, I'm guilty too. I'm guilty too. My brother and I, many times, uh, well, there's a couple of times me and my brother got in trouble when we were young, okay? We were both in trouble. And we both stood before my dad. I was guilty. He was guilty. I never one time, standing before my dad, when I realized the guilt that I was in, that day I wasn't looking for justice. You know what I was looking for that day? I was looking for mercy. I was looking for mercy. I don't want justice. I want mercy. These people want justice. But all of a sudden, when they start looking at themselves and they see that they're in just the same boat that she's in, all of a sudden now, I'm not looking for justice. I'm looking for mercy. I never once, when I stood with my dad and my brother's in trouble, I'm in trouble. We both done the same thing. And I'm thinking, Daddy, you ought to whip him hard now. You need to let him have it. I'm thinking like this. Uh, he won't do it again, Dad. Let him off. <laughs> you know, let him off. We need to see mercy here today. Oh, they weren't looking for mercy. They cared nothing about this woman. She stood by herself. They thought they stood in the crowd. They thought they stood with their friends. And, and all of a sudden, when the sins get pointed at us, we start recognizing that we are all sinners. For all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all are sinners. We can't point fingers at others. We are guilty. We should be looking for mercy. Mercy. We may not think we belong, but we do belong. Several years ago, I took a, a young man to, uh, to court. And as I went took him to court, I, I was sitting back in the courtroom, and they had, a, I bet they was a, hundred people seemed like it in there and the judge was calling them up one at a time uh, dealing with them and you stood there as he done the sentence and I'm going to tell you something about that court there was one person in there that had the authority and that was the judge and they come before the judge and what that judge said let me tell you something was law there was no arguing with the judge those people were going up there left and right and I mean he had dropped that gavel and it was done it was done. But there was one woman, and, 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 and I hate to say this, but a lot of those people that was in that room looked, a lot of them looked like they belonged in that room. But there was one woman, she was well-dressed, I mean, real proper, looked like she was very well-educated, and she was sitting in that group, and I was looking, and she was in the seat right in front of me, and I was watching her. And I could tell what she was there for, it something to do with traffic. Because she had a driver's test in her hand, and she had one of those sticky notes, you know, kind of like I have on my body. Little sticky notes that stick out the top. She had it, three or four or five sticks st stuck in there, and she sat there going over it. The laws of the road. And uh, I thought, uh-oh, I'm interested to see how this turns out. Because this is a very well-educated woman. I imagine she'd go up here and tell this judge a thing or two. I think she was prepared to tell that judge a thing or two. And so they called her name out. She gets up. She walked up, and she's got this book in her hand. And uh, she, uh, this is how it went. It, it was kind of hilarious. I could tell she had a planned out presentation of the facts and how she interpreted the book and all this kind of thing. She had it in her hand. She come and said, are you Mary Smith? Yeah. He slapped it. Guilty. Pay the plaintiff. She, but, but, <laughs> she didn't get to argue her case. She might not have thought it was fair. But that's the law. For all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. We all are sinners. And it says, for the wages of sin is death. Because we come to the realization we all know we're sinners, we're all going to die. That's the penalty. That's the wages of sin. And when we stand before the Lord, we stand guilty and we stand all alone and we're helpless and there's nothing else that we can do. So they brought this woman and now they expecting to see what Jesus would do to be able to accuse him of what he's done. To tempt him. And it said in verse 7, and when they continued answering, uh, con and they continued 
asking him, he lifted up himself and said among him, He that was without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. They which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, and Jesus had lifted up himself, and he saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Had no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. She found herself standing alone with all her accusers, and all of a sudden they're all gone, and she's standing alone, and it's just her and Jesus. Her and Jesus. Jesus didn't stand condemning her. Jesus didn't stand her and ridicule her. Jesus didn't come and just tell her all the faults that she had. Jesus said, I don't condemn you. In other words, I'll be your friend. I'll stand here with you. I'll not stand here against you. I'll stand here with you. I wonder today, is Jesus standing with us or is he standing against us? He was willing to stand with her rather than against her. But now there were one conditions put upon him standing with her, go and sin no more. Now, a lot of people want to think that Jesus forgives us for all our sins and everybody's forgiven, everybody goes to heaven. But no, Jesus said, look, there's an expectation of you. We need to stop it. We need to change. We need to follow God's instructions and God's law. God's law. God's mercy is shown upon us, but that mercy, it has an expectation for us to change. For us to change. To follow the words of God, the teachings of God. He wasn't going to condemn her. He's going to stand with her, but he expects her. Expects her to go and sin no more. So we find where we're guilty. But in verse 12 it says, And then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We found this woman that was caught in adultery. Basically, her life had come to an end. Her life was ended. She had no hope. She was helpless. But Jesus was the life of life. He's the one that leads us to what life is. There's a lot of people that are walking around in the body. They're breathing. They're taking up space. But folks, they're not really living. They're dying. They're dying. And when a person is dying, they are helpless and they're hopeless and They're miserable. A person that's really living is a person that has real, true life. Jesus says, I am the life. I am the one that provides life. 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 Folks, when he provides life, we have have some enthusiasm. We have this excitement that goes on in our lives. Life. Folks, Jesus gave us life. That's something to brag about. That's something to talk about. That's something to get excited about. I've shared this before, but I still love sharing it because it was such an ex- expression. I'd gone to see a lady at the hospital, and she'd, I didn't think she was that bad, but had prayer with her, and I left. And before I got back to the house, they called me and let me know that she passed. She passed. Her husband called to tell me she passed and wanted to know if I'd go tell his wife's mother. So I go to see his wife's mother to tell her and I share with her that she had died. In the meantime, my wife comes driving up and said they'd called back from the hospital to tell me that they have revived her and she is alive. Let me tell you, that was no small stir. That was no small stir. I mean, when they pronounced they hadn't pronounced her. The husband had pronounced her dead. He'd done given up. The chaplain was at the hospital with him. He had given up. They'd gone to the chaplain's office to call. So my wife coming up with excitement. She's alive. She's alive. 
The, the woman's mother told me, you, go to the hospital, go to the hospital. She's excited. I didn't begin fixing to start calling all the other family to tell them that she's dead. And I've got one of the deacon's women. I'm frustrated. We get in my car and I'm saying, I can't believe this. I'm not excited. I'm thinking they've just put her on a ventilator. They're just here, you know, imitating life. And this is just something they're going to have to go through twice. It is frustrating. I was frustrated all the way to the hospital that they had given these people false hope. Low, little faith was me. I get to the hospital, go into the emergency room, and I go in expecting to find this woman just on life support and just a little small heartbeat. But I go in, and this woman looks at me. Like, hey, preacher. I think... She was alive. She was alive. That was, a, that was no small stir. This was like on a Thursday. Sunday morning, Lazarus was sitting on my back pew back there. She was alive. Can you imagine the, 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 the excitement in our service that day? Somebody, we done got through town and everybody, she's dead. Now she's alive. Let me tell you, Jesus gives life. Jesus gives life. People that are lonely or helpless and hopeless, we come to Jesus, we have something to talk about. We have something to share. It's not, well, I just got baptized. Folks, I've got life. i got life. That baptism is just a, a symbol. It's an illustration of what God's given me. He's given me life. He's brought me from the grave to life. Life. Oh, I'm not alone anymore because he is with me. He is with me. When you're laying in that bed and you draw your last breath, you may think, I'm alone. But Jesus said, I'm the life. I give you breath. I give you life. I give you help in a time of need. He says, I am the light of life. And the Pharisees, therefore, said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, and thy record is not true. So let's talk about what truth is. They said the truth was this woman was calling an adultery. This woman should be put to death. And now they're telling Jesus' words is not true. It is true. He says you can't bear a record of yourself. You've got to have a witness. Let me tell you something. Jesus isn't alone. Jesus is not alone. He shares that. He says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear a record of myself, Yet my record is true, for I know whom I came and where I go. But you cannot tell which I come and whether I go. You judge as to the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone. But I am, I and my Father that sent me. My Heavenly Father's with me. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. There are people in a home, they feel alone because they don't feel companion. They don't feel someone that cares and that they're with them. They're not on the same page, even with the one they're married to. That's sad. So you can be around folks and still be alone. But Jesus says, I'm not alone. I've got a person that bears witness to everything that I do. That's me and my father. We all always together. Always together. When I was a little boy, my grandparents, they lived about a quarter of a mile and he had to go across the, uh, the pasture there and around the woods to their house and we went up, uh, wanted to go visit them. So we, my brother and I would go visit my grandparents. It got late. It got dark. And I called my mom. I said, uh, my grandparents said, you need, are you going home? You know, you know how grandparents are. You going home? Well... We might want to go to bed, you know. You going home? Well, I called my mom. I said, uh, we ready to go, uh, come home? I said, you going to come get us? I said, son, we didn't take you up there. You walked up there on your own. You can walk yourself back home. I'm thinking, it's dark out there. We were very young, probably five, six years old. I'm thinking, it's dark. It wasn't dark when we came here. Mama said, and I was scared of the dark, but I was more scared of Mama if I didn't come on home. So I thought, well, we got to go home. I knew my brother, he was, a, he was 11 months younger than I, I knew, I knew he was scared, so I, I held on to his hand. Because <laughs> I know he was scared. 
So we was holding hands, not that I liked my brother that much, but I didn't want to be alone out there by myself. So we started walking home. The further we walked, the faster we walked. Until that far, uh, fa- uh, walk started getting to a jog, next thing we were running as fast as we could. And all of a sudden, my shoe come off. And just reflexes, I turned loose my brother's hand to go back and get that shoe because I know if I come home with that shoe, Mama would go make me go out there and find that shoe in the dark. I didn't want to do that, so I'd better get that shoe. You know what? As scared as my brother was, he didn't worry about me. He left, he kept going, he didn't stop. I was out there looking for a shoe in the dark all along, all along. Oh, that was a bad feeling. I was all by myself. Nobody, nobody. I mean, even with my brother, I didn't think much of him, but just having him helped a little bit. But when he was gone, I had nothing. I had nothing, just me. That's not a good feeling to be all alone. Jesus, when he walked on this earth, he was persecuted. He, he was uh, falsely accused. But let me tell you, he kept his head up. You know why? Because he never was alone. He said, I've got my father with me. David, the psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for he's with me. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Folks, if we feel alone today, we're alone because we choose to be alone because he offers to be with us. He offers to be with us through anything that we go through. Jesus says, I'm not alone. But I and my Father that sent me. It is also written in the law that the testimony of two men is true. It's true. We both go through it. We both deal with it. It's true. I am the one that bears witness of myself. And the Father that sent me bears witness of me also. He knows we're together. Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? And Jesus answered, Neither... uh, uh, Neither knoweth me nor my father. You do not know me. You have known me, yet you should have known my father. You should know my father. And these words spake Jesus in the treasury that they taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. And then verse 21. Then said Jesus again unto them, Go, I go my way, and you shall see me, uh, seek me, and you shall die in your sins. Whether I go, you cannot come. You shall die in your sins. We need to understand everybody's sin. That's the truth. There's people that's going to die in their sins and they're going to die alone. If they don't have Jesus, they'll die alone. They'll die alone in their sins. If I die being a sinner and I have Jesus with me, guess what? I've got someone that can overcome that sin. The one that can forgive sin. The one that can cleanse us from sin. He said, you cannot go. Why? Because we don't accept Jesus. If we're here today alone, Jesus wants to be with us. If we're alone today, we don't have to be alone. If we feel helpless today, hopeless in our situation, we don't have to be that way. Jesus, with open arms, he said, I want to go with you. I want to go with you on your job. I want to go with you into your home. I want to go with you to the doctor. I want to go with you wherever you go. I want to be with you. We don't have to be alone. Sometimes we just choose to be alone. When we get alone, we just feel hopeless. We feel like we can't do anything about it. But Jesus here today with open arms, I want to be with you. Is Jesus with you today or do you just choose to be alone? Because God said in the very beginning, it's not good to be alone. We need Jesus in our lives. Maybe we just need to open our heart's door and invite him in to be with us. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for your word, for the invitation to be part of our lives. We come to the truth of who we are. We come to the truth that we can't be at, handle it by ourselves. We come to the truth that we need your help. We need your presence in our lives, in our situation. And I pray, Lord, we come to you. We lift our needs up to you. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen.